if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. <sighs> patience. Oh my goodness. Um, a source of anxiety for you? Yes. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> yeah, yes. Actually, yes. <laughs>Um, Watkins uses is they need to understand that they can embody grace under pressure. And I love that phrase. Now, my, okay, but what, how do you do that? Yeah, exactly. That question. was that was my question is, and I've got it written here, in fact. So how do we do this? Uh, uh, I, I'm a big fan of Bob Goff. And one of the things that he talks about is um, he has two phrases that I, I keep coming back to. One is become love, mm -hmm. and the other is memorize grace. And memorize so, grace. Okay. how do we how do we do that? And I, you know, truthfully, I think um, we could all improve on this. You know, embodying grace under pressure. When you're totally stressed out, and yeah. you're, you know, you look at the day ahead and you think, I don't. I, I'm not going to get through all this. Yeah. There is just no way. No space for it. And then everything starts cropping up, all those little things that you don't want to have happen. Mm -hmm. I, you know, how do you remember, how do you bring yourself back to, I, I still need to be gracious. I still need to be graceful. I still need to remember that God has given me the grace to get through this. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he starts He starts out the very first paragraph towards the end. He says, but as Christians, we, we can turn to the Bible for God's solution to anxiety, focusing mm -hmm. on Christ and the hope we have in him. Now, I circled that and went, can, we must, we must turn to the Bible and, you know, for God's solution to anxiety. We, we tend to glorify our problems, right, rather than glorifying God as our creator and the solution. Um you know, we sing we sing these songs every week. He's waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Like if we're focused on those things, then I think the stress, what we experience when we start with our to do list and then things interfere with it. I think often he's saying, um, "Hello, excuse me, I had a different agenda for you today, right?" Mm -hmm. And so part of that responding with grace, I think, is to sit and listen and. Because we know we know you don't get anywhere when you just kick and scream and yell and and have a tantrum and have a tantrum through it, right? I mean that's never really the solution. Um, but when we can stop and say, "Okay, Lord, obviously you have a different plan for me today. What is it?" Um, and often I think when I'm most frustrated, you know, your teenagers. I have a teenager, a couple of teenagers at home, and. 
you know, they never really talk to you. They spend a lot of time in their room and they just disappear for hours on end. And then when you're really busy and you need to do something and you're, or you're trying to read or prepare something, then they come and they stand right next to you and they start telling you their life story. And it's kind of irritating, right? <laughs> it's a source of anxiety <laughs> and stress because you really just want them to go away so that you can do what you need to do. But I have learned over the last year or so that God's like going, um, stop, stop what you're doing. Whatever it is you think is so important is not right now. This relationship is important. So my grace under pressure is often to just close the laptop and turn and listen and hear whatever silly video game they're playing <laughs> or whatever drama's going on in the friend group at school. Um, and yeah, I hope that's grace. I hope that's what it's supposed to look like. Because that at least I, I can I can quantify and say yeah okay I did that. Knock <laughs> it off. I think well I think that is a good example of grace under pressure. I I'm gonna quote Bob Goff okay. again. Um, his his article yesterday. Charlie and I are using uh, "Live in Grace, Walk in Love," uh, his daily devotional. Uh, we're doing that reading every day. And last night's reading cracked me up because we're talking about anxiety. And that's Bob's article from yesterday. But he talked about um, how worry and distraction always travel together. Mm -hmm. um, he says, we're worried, so we're distracted. And people who are distracted can't be present. So how do we go back to being where our feet are? Yeah. And I, to me, that was a really helpful thought because, yeah, when you're when you're anxious, when you're worried, you can't you're focused on that and you can't be focused on anything else. So mm -hmm. closing your laptop and saying, I'm not going to deal with this issue mm -hmm. right now. I'm going to deal with this person who is so important to me and who will be and going to college <laughs> for another year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> who will be going to college mm -hmm. soon. And he also says that God hasn't brought you this far only to forget your name. Right. Uh, Jesus uh, said that we wouldn't, we won't add anything to our lives by worrying. We'll just miss seeing Him at work. Mm -hmm. So rather than live our lives distracted, we're better off trusting that God will come through once again. Instead of hiding under the table, He wants us to grab a front row seat so we won't miss the action. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, I think that's really important. And I think that is grace under pressure. I think that's yeah. how we how we deal with those times where we're off the chart with too much to do, too much emotion, too much world crashing yeah. in on us. Yeah. And the point that, that um, Eric Watkins makes in the article is, you know, anxiety is not new. Or maybe you said that earlier, but he, he's kind of saying the same thing. It's not mm -hmm. a new problem. It wasn't. Uh, original to the church at Rome either and they were having a hard time and so Paul's like jumping in saying you know what they needed was to have their anxious eyes taken off the things of this world and its false gods and to have their eyes fixed on Christ and the sure hope of heaven that belongs to those who belong to him we need an eternal perspective yeah I think the enemy does um, a lot of what he would categorize as good work in keeping us distracted and keeping us from kingdom work by keeping us just busy, 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 busy. You know, yeah. the tyranny of the urgent. Yes. It's all those things that make our life easier and yet uh, produce an expectation that everything is instant. Um, yeah. You know, and it's not really that way. God And God is on the long game. <laughs> He's not necessarily. <laughs> that's that's one of the things, one of the other phrases that I really liked in this article. He says that Christians are a chronological yeah. paradox, that we live on earth, but we belong in heaven. Yeah. And he's talking about, he says that we've got the wrong end of the stick, basically, when we think about eschatology. Eschatology is just a big phrase to, to say it's a study of the the last things or the end times and we get focused on you know who's the antichrist and you know what does yeah. 666 mean and and he said that's that's not, not the, the point. point yeah you know the point is that there is a time when Jesus is going to return and things are going to be completely different 
And Paul talks about in Ephesians how um, we're here on earth, but we're also seated with Jesus. And it's like, you know, how do you Don't get ask me your, how that works. Yeah. yeah. How do you get your mind wrapped around that and live it every mm-hmm. day? It's mm-hmm. uh, to me, it's just really so difficult. Yeah. And yet it's the reality we live in. We don't necessarily recognize the reality, but it is the reality we live in. And so we are a, a paradox yeah. that we're we're living here and we're going through our day to day stuff right here. And yet we're up there as well. Yeah. And to to try and grasp that reality and might make you anxious. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but to, to if we were able to grasp that reality and say, you know, okay, I'm facing these issues right now today, and the world is going crazy, and my life isn't where I mm-hmm. want it to be, but meanwhile Jesus is is seated at the right hand of the Father, mm-hmm. interceding for us, and we are with him spiritually right. right what am i worried about yeah you know why why am i so concerned about this stuff mm-hmm. when there's that yeah facing me and but that i think that's it's our, hard our, our constant hard. challenge is yeah. how do we how do we grasp that reality and live it i don't even remember when i first heard this already and not yet phrase or terminology for it but it's it's really the right description um, and he, he spends a, several paragraphs in the article talking about it. And he said, we expect the crown of glory now and are too easily disrailed in our faith when God places on us the cross of suffering instead. Because yeah. I think, again, that, that unease we feel, that anxiety, is often because we're looking for the wrong thing. It's an unmet expectation, right? Just like the source of so many other problems. <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, but I want this version of it. And God's like, no, you need this version right now because I am sanctifying you for your eternal life with me. And we're like, oh, well. Yeah. And part of that is, is where he goes toward the end of the article where he talks about what God is doing in us is conforming us to the image of Jesus. So when we go through those hard times and those problems and those things that cause anxiety, part of that is he's working in us to make us look more like Jesus. Mm-hmm. And we don't see that that end state. We're just, you know, we're stuck in the right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, but in, and through that, God is working yeah. to make us look more like Jesus, to be more like Jesus. Which should be the end yeah. game, you know, the goal we're all trying for. Yeah. One of the things I like is that he used, um, I, I mentioned this before, he used Romans chapter 8. He starts at verse 18 and takes it almost to the end of the chapter. But um, I would encourage you to go ahead and read through that and read through it to the end. over and over again because the, the promise that Paul is presenting there is is a solution to anxiety it's i think it's helpful to think about it you know he talks about um the sufferings of this present age are not worth comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed to us we're we're so stuck right here that we can't Mm -hmm. see that glory that's coming uh he talks about how uh we've been adopted as children of god and he says in this hope we were saved but if what we hope for, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. <sighs> patience. Oh my goodness. Um, A source of anxiety for you? Yes. Yeah. Apparently. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Actually. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that I don't have enough patience makes yeah. me anxious. Yeah. Um, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we don't know what to pray but the Spirit himself intercedes mm-hmm. for us. And so mm-hmm. we can be in the middle of something that is just absolutely overwhelming, mm-hmm. and we don't have the words, but the Spirit has the words, and the Spirit yeah. prays for us. So, yeah. I, I, you know, I just, like I say, I think Romans 8 is my favorite chapter, and so just going through, through that and seeing the promises that Paul presents to us from Jesus, it, it's like, okay, this is horrible, this is hard. I don't want to be here and I don't want to deal with this, but I can come back to this this. and say, 
okay, the Lord has this, yeah. and he does not love me any less because I'm going through hard times. Yeah. He loves me just as much, and he is with me and will, yeah. will carry me through. Yeah. Not necessarily to where I want to go, but to where he wants me to go. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, Christ is our hope, and that that's what we have to focus on um, rather than focusing on the problem and getting stuck in the, in the weeds. You know, God's saying, no, look to me. And I've got it. You know, that's why there was so much time spent in the in the Old Testament for the Israelites to rehearse the good deeds of the Lord, to stack the stones, to raise the Ebenezers, like to remember what he has done, because that's what allows us to step back, find that peace and say, OK, God, I, I this is not how I would do it. But apparently you would like me to focus on this yeah. um, and find our strength in him. I think the the other piece of this that is important for us to remember is we don't have to strike out on our own to do this. No. The Lord is with us. Yeah. The Spirit intercedes for us, and we have and we one have the another. Body. Yeah. So that we can, we're supposed to come alongside one another. We're mm-hmm. supposed to bear one another's burdens. Mm-hmm. We're supposed to do all those one another's, not by ourselves because we can't. But to come alongside one another and say, you know, you're carrying this load and it looks to me like it's pretty heavy for you. Yeah. How can I help you right now? Yeah. And we're not supposed to be Lone Ranger Christians. (laughs) That doesn't work very well. It doesn't work very well. Yeah. Yeah. So cast your cares on him Mm -hmm. and help your brother or sister in need. Yeah. That's really it. All right. We'll see you next week. Switching topics. We don't know what they are yet, but but we'll get back to you. (laughs) Stay tuned for the next one. Okay.